I met Dr. Shukla in Washington, D.C., where he's the director of the Center for Ocean, Land, Atmosphere Studies at George Mason University. Looking forward to chatting. You're a man of science, but that didn't come easy, did it, in your childhood? Oh, no, not at all, uh, because I was born in a village which has no electricity, no, you know, drinking water from the well, but also I was not from a rich family. I had no shoes till I was a teenager and walking um, bullock cart is the only transportation to go to the city. But if there's a big trip, like a marriage, then I could use an elephant for 10 miles or so. Wow, but also access to, to science books. Okay, just... so there's, there's absolutely no science. So for the first 10th grade, I studied no science because there was no science in the village school. I studied Sanskrit and economics and Hindi but my father was so determined that I should study science that we went to a college for 11th grade and he said, please admit my children, uh, my son <laughs> into the science. He said, I can't because he has no science. Uh, then finally, my father kind of convinced him that, okay, he said, we'll take a test. And then my father went and bought all the science books for six, seven, eight, nine, ten, five 10, five grades. And for the whole summer, I just had to study. I couldn't be grazing cows or, you know, I couldn't be going out in the field. And luckily I passed the test. So that's how I got into science. In 2016, Shukla became an honorary member of the American Meteorological Society in recognition of his outstanding achievements in the atmospheric sciences. Shukla has also been involved with several organizations dedicated to social justice, poverty reduction, and rural development. He established Gandhi College in his village in India for education of rural students, especially women. One of the things that you said uh, prior to the interview is just the, I, I don't know if it's misunderstanding or, or uh, you know, ignorance when it comes to just the definition, climate, uh, global warming, all of that. So break it down for us because there is confusion out oh, there. Oh, absolutely. So the first day in my class I asked, why nights are colder than day? That's the very first question. And they all hands go up. I say, yes. He says, sunset, there's no sun. Then I tell them, for that answer, you will get a B minus in this class. And they are so surprised. Why? I said, just think about it. Why it will get cold? After sun is not there, it will not get any more warmer. But why will it get cold? So you see, the correct answer of this question, why it gets cold, correct answer, has beginning to understand climate change. The reason it gets cold at night is not just because sun is not there. Earth is losing energy 24 hours a day, daytime and nighttime. This is something that is not emphasized. You always say, oh, sun's energy is coming, is heating the, the, the Earth. The amount of energy that is coming from the sun, which is about 120,000 trillion watts, is the same amount of energy that Earth loses all the time. And it is the balance between these two energies that determines the climate. And there is a certain temperature at which the balance is obtained. We call that climate. So that balance was at 14 degrees centigrade for 100 years. Like for the 14 degrees centigrade of the global average, the two energies were in balance. Now, they are in balance with 15 degrees. Why? because there's so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So you see, this basic question of why nights are colder than day has essence of understanding the, how climate is maintains itself. And this is what people don't understand, that this is a balance. You know, some of the religious, uh, some of the people uh, who don't want to believe, they say, oh, the earth is so huge, the ocean is so large, mountains is huge. How can little CO2 can make a difference? because they don't understand it's a balance, very, very strong balance. You mentioned the word energy, and when we think of energy and, and advances uh, in civilization, we think of uh, coal and how it uh, really revolutionized the Industrial Revolution. Um, but, you know, if you travel to places like India or, or China and, uh, and you're out, you wear the mask because the, the pollution is just so bad, 
Um, coal, there seems to be a shift. I mean, these are ingredients that are out there, and people keep talking about it and saying we've got to do something about it, but, but the movement's too slow, isn't it? Here is the dilemma. It is the fossil fuels which are responsible for the explosive growth of our civilization for the last 200 years. It's the fossil fuels. We have a much better standard of life, better health, you know, travel, because of fossil fuels. But now, climate scientists have found, but, but they will do a major harm. So that's why it is a very difficult problem. We just have to accept that. It is a difficult problem. But now we know that this is a problem, and we should do something. And the transition, people are recognizing, I mean, some places people don't even accept, for example, the Republican Party in the US. I'm just sort of not joking. It is actually, if you look at the data, you find that there is a very clear divide between the liberal, you know, sort of uh, progressive groups and the conservative uh, Republicans group. They just, they just don't want to believe in this, no matter how much evidence you have. So that's a big problem. And con uh, but most of the people in the world actually believe that that it is because of the fossil fuels that we are burning. Now the question is, what can we do? So I have been in those meetings where governments are debating what to do. So here's the dilemma for them. They want to increase the standard of living of their people, okay? Uh, they, they really want to, and in order to do that, they have to increase the consumption. They need energy, and this is the cheapest and easiest way to get energy. So in my opinion, that is the reason it is not happening so fast. Because people are not worried about the future as much as they are worried about now and their elections to this. If policymakers, governments, make a decision to do it, they can do it. I, 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 I don't think that uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Yes, there will be some difficulties, but the difficulty is not, not doing it so much more. A warming climate can cause seawater to expand and glaciers to melt, both of which can create a rise in sea level. Without changes, scientists believe the steady rise will mean an end to most of the coastal cities in the world, including Shanghai, Tokyo, and Bangkok. Currently, more than 10% of the world's population lives in coastal cities. You say a difficult situation, and we hear this a lot, and the alarm bells should be going off. But when you, when you say that, when does it get to the point of no return? I mean, when, when okay. do we get... This is a very good question. And the best report for it just came out one week ago. Okay, so it's called IPCC report. And basically, the conclusion is that if we can start bending the curve in 2025, we're not saying we have to stop we cannot stop i know that's the reality but you know it's going up and you can go up maybe for another two years but then if you can start going down and if we can achieve the uh 50 percent reduction by 2050 that will be uh will avoid serious climate change and i don't know what do you mean by serious climate change if that global average which has now one degree already if it becomes two degrees, then we are already in some trouble. So our goal is 1.5 degrees. But this is a global number. It is just like you know, measuring fever. You know, oh, it just says that, oh, you have a problem. But one, two degrees, global mean difference means you can have local temperature in uh, Phoenix, 30 degrees higher in some days. I mean, it will be, uh, already you might have heard in the last few years, some runways. Uh, kind of melted. U.S. is the worst example because this is the only country where the political system itself is divided about what to do. In India, everybody agrees that you have to do, and the only difference is how to do it. Here, there is no even agreement that we need to do it. Do you see? And uh, that that was was sort of the essence of our letter. Let me just throw out items at you and maybe just have sure, you sure. kind of yeah. uh, rattle off, because these are things that come up all the time. The violent storms that we see, people yeah. talk about the intensity of them. Uh, is, that, is that a result of, of... Yeah, it's very simple to understand scientifically. When you increase the temperature of the air, okay, the amount of water it can hold is high. 
you, you see that all, all the time, right? The, the temperature determines how much water you can hold into the air. In the winter season, you blow from your mouth. Do you see far sort of, why? Because the temperature is low, so that air can hold very little. So if you blow, that's enough water coming off it, okay? So therefore, when it gets warmer, then it can hold more water. So now there's more water. So the same storm, when it starts raining, it has so much more water to rain. So that's why we have very big, big floods and, and you know, huge high intensity rainfalls. So that's the, it is all expected, this is sort of totally consistent, predicted that this kind of things will happen. Same thing with the ocean level is rising. You hit the water, it expands. Right? That's the property of water, it expands. So as the temperature is increasing, the whole ocean is expanding. That's why the sea level is rising, half of the region. The other half is that the ice is melting on the land and going to the ocean. So right now, both are causing 50-50. So it's, it's so well understandable and well understood, these, 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 these events. Heat waves, same thing, right? When it is very warm, then, and also, that's another problem, is that it also gets dry. Warm, dry, that's your, right there, less soil moisture in the ground, there is your uh, perfect storm. Dr. Shukla made headlines in 2015 when he sent a letter to the Obama administration asking them to prosecute global warming skeptics with an anti-mafia law, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO. The letter said the government should prosecute groups that have knowingly deceived the American people about the risks of climate change as a means to forestall America's response to climate change. Then I was reading Washington Post one day and Senator Selden Whitehouse had written an article and he said, you know, tobacco industry used to do the same thing for many years. Tobacco industry said, there's no harm to smoking. Smoking doesn't cause any harm. And then there were a lot of scandals. You might have seen the movie, how the, somebody came from inside, the records were found that tobacco industry knew that it is harmful, but it was hiding. Okay, then government sued them with something called RICO. And when I read that, I asked my friends, why we can't use RICO for the fossil fuel industry? You know, these are 20 very distinguished scientists, okay? They are my friends. And we wrote a letter to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Selden White House. Hey, we support your idea because there's no other explanation. Fossil fuel industry is misinforming the people. That was our key thing and somebody should investigate them. Then somebody in the group says, why are you writing to Selden White House? Why don't you write to Obama himself? And the Attorney General he says, fine, whatever the group wants. So we changed the letter to Obama <laughs> and the Attorney General. I was still the lead signatory, okay? And the letter went, oh my God, it created a storm, you won't believe, the fossil fuel industry supported websites, there were about 20 or 30 of them, they wrote the nastiest articles for like months and months, and the phone calls and the dirty emails, go back to India, you know, this sort of, uh, and then, oh, you are stealing money because I told you we had a non-profit that was funded by government for 20 years. Oh, all this money that government gave. So they went after that, and I went and fought with the congressman, well, his group, you know, this is, I answered all their questions. This is, and then they had no questions. I explained to them everything my institute does, and so on. Then this congressman, his name is Lamar Smith, big denier of climate change. All his funding used to come from uh, fossil fuel industry. Then he wrote to the Inspector General of National Science Foundation, which has funded me for the past 20 years. Hey, please review all his 20-year grants. Every check issued in 20 years, every expense, every, that, have to, that was stressful, I can tell you. And people kept telling me, you know, why don't you give up? Why don't you accept, you know, uh, change your opinion? No, I said, no, I'll fight. I'll fight till the end. Guess what? Lamar Smith decided not to run again because we were to go, go, go after him. Because you see, we realized by that time that we can't just be quiet if some congressman goes after scientists. You know, we have to make sure that he doesn't get elected. But anyway, he dropped out. So it was a, very satisfactory ending, but a lot of stress. 
because you won't believe how mean and how abusive the the language and the articles can be. Articles can be. So we're here in Washington. Uh, it is a place of policy and politics. Um, it must make you think a lot about the importance of elections, the importance of leaders. Talk to me a little bit about that. Oh, it is not just important. In my opinion, it is most important because some of the young people don't like to hear this, but any amount of work on an individual level is of course good, it is appreciable, but the real change will happen only when policies are made, which will make the real impact on changing. That's the, uh, I mean, you know, personal consumption, personal habits, they're all very important. But policy and is the most important part, both national and international policy. And even language is important. You were just describing uh, during the Bush presidency for eight years, the absence of words. Oh, absolutely. He never used the word climate. Forget about climate change. He never used the word climate. I mean, it's just unbelievable that how far the polit politicians are going to go to deny something which is absolutely proven by science to be true and totally, you know, right in the... Uh, and we, as scientists, we just scratch our head. Why? What's this? And, of course, then we are told that, well, they depend upon their campaign contributions. They depend upon the, the funding they get for the elections. So that's what I said. It's a very complex problem which in some way is going to influence the future of humanity, but it also depends upon the election, which may be in one year or two years or four years. At George Mason University, Dr. Shukla studies the predictability of weather and climate variations. This research helps with the understanding of rainfall during monsoon seasons. High winds and rain is responsible for major floods in Southeast Asia every year. I have to ask you about George Mason because I, I think it's really unique what you did there. Um, you created something out of whole cloth. Uh, do you consider yourself an entrepreneur and what was that experience like? It was actually, a, a, uh, first of all, it's just such a wonderful and satisfying experience to be able to create a new department create this whole new sort of emphasis on the campus about atmosphere, ocean, land, create and create a new PhD program. I think that uh, the, the young generation is the one who will fix this problem. Uh, and by the way, talking about young generation, the other thing that always makes me very good is that my wife and I decided to create a college for women in my village, in the village of my birth in India. And that was a challenge, you know, sitting here, you know, phone calls and so on. That has been such a successful enterprise. There are 800 students now studying, girls in the village who could not go. So I think that these, my goal is to be do whatever we can do little, you know, to improve lives of others. I, I have to ask one follow-up uh, based on what you just said. Um, do you get back to that village and do oh, you go every there? Every year, go yeah. once, twice. So yeah. I have gone to my village 100 times. And do you think back to that child that didn't have shoes and, and how oh, their journey I, in life? I tell you, not only I think back, I go and see them now. You know, when I see them, so the, most of the situation has not changed a lot. You know, the sum is still there, are, there, there are pockets. And uh, the beauty is that I go to my village, I become a villager again. It all comes back. You know, this is I study using the local language, of course I start eating the local food. No, that's, many times I have felt that it recharges me, <laughs> okay. okay. It's a long trip, but uh, anybody in India invites me for a lecture, I say, yes, I'm coming, but I must go to my village. So that's how I managed to keep in touch with my, my village. But there's gotta be enormous pressure that you bring on yourself because in many respects uh, those in poverty have no voice. You recognize it. You recognize that they're also victims of this. Um, so it's got to be on your part a, a clarion call for them, not just for yourself. No, you are absolutely right. And so what does one do? I, I tell you what I do. 
I, this has been a problem. So after the climate science and GMU and the, my village, what is the third big project I'm working on right now for the last term? Minimum wage. Mm. So there is an organization called One Fair Wage, and I'm a board member of that. And right here, we work so hard to get a uh, ballot initiative passed four years ago that the minimum wage of the restaurant workers in Washington will be also same as the other minimum wage, $14, $15. Guess what? The restaurant industry managed to overturn this through the council. So we are doing it now again, this year, which is going to be again on the ballot. My point is that, uh, you see, when you get anxiety, the same thing I tell my young students, if you have climate anxiety, the way to handle it is climate action. Action is the way to ha handle anxiety. So I have been very concerned about, you know, minimum wage problem I felt so bad five years ago when I joined this. You know, minimum wage is $7.50, you know, for the federal minimum wage. But neither I nor many of my professors knew that the federal minimum wage for restaurant workers is $2. This is a fact that this is called tipped minimum wage. There are two minimum wages. That was started during slavery, and it's going on. So I'm working, so that's my way to, to, to feel good. Okay, I'm trying to do something about it. It's been a great conversation. I can't thank you enough. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay.